It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's event and our distinguished speaker, Dr. Louis Menard. He's a Lee a Simpson Family Professor of and Arts and Science and the N.T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of English at Harvard. And presents today on the presence of the humanities, um, which in lots of ways is coming off a piece that um, he has recently published and it's kind of on and off engaging this larger question about the changes in our humanities. For some, these changes go under the title of a crisis. Others see this more as a larger change in our higher education, but it's something that is of immense interest to us. Now, our distinguished speaker is the author of good many books, but also of a Pulitzer Prize. Um, he's been the editor of the Editor. I speak in two voices here today, I think. He's <laughs> another one. The one is familiar, the other one is not. So, but that's maybe a different um, um, sensation. And then, sorry about that, an editor of the New Yorker and a contributing editor of the New York Review of Books. Um, he's currently staff writer also of the New Yorker and has been awarded the National Humanities Medal by President Barack Obama in 2016. He has many books. His most notable one is the Metaphysical Club, which indeed won in 2002 the Pulitzer Prize in history. Uh, we're really excited. This CV goes on and on, but we do want to get to the presence of the humanities and have a chance to talk about this. So um, please join me all in welcome our, welcoming our distinguished speaker today and I'm handing it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be able to talk to you. Uh, however, remotely. Um, the weird title of the talk was mine because I was a little nervous about calling it the future of the humanities because then you would expect me to predict what's going to happen uh, to the academic humanities in the future. And I am bad at predicting things as most human beings are. So what I hope to do is to sketch out what the problem, crisis, opportunity, however you want to define it, seems to be right now. It's probably familiar to, to you as well. And then to offer my thoughts about why we're in the situation that we're in. And then what I think is important uh, to think about are the institutional obstacles to uh, any changes that we might wanna make. Um, so uh, I will begin by saying that the crisis is not really an intellectual one, I don't think, because I think that most professors in the humanities can offer a reasonable justification for what they do as researchers and scholars and writers and what they teach. Um, there's always disagreements about how we should be approaching our fields, but that's kind of the nature of the humanities is that we're constantly arguing about approach. Um, and uh, it's particularly in a field, I'm in English, which is a very big tent discipline. It's a lot of stuff that gets countered as English and we're always disagreeing, but I don't think the disagreements are really the problem right now. The problem is just bodies. Uh, undergraduates are not taking our courses, no matter how sexy or relevant, if we make them appear to be, um, students are, uh, are not enrolling in our classes. That's true, as I'll explain, both at the level of students who are choosing to major in a humanities field uh, and students who are just enrolling uh, in the, our courses as electives. I'm going to use some data from Harvard because it's, it's at hand for me, it's familiar to me, but uh, I've also looked at national trends and, of course, what's going on at Harvard is just consistent with what's going on nationally. Um, a big research university like UT or like Harvard is actually suffering more from this problem of student flight than smaller schools are. Uh, but everybody pretty much, there's some ex obviously exceptions out there, everybody pretty much has experienced this uh, erosion of student interest. Um, I want to note a major distinction uh, between a school like Harvard and a school like yours, which is that Harvard is a purely liberal arts and sciences college which means that it does not offer any vocational or pre-professional courses. You can't take a course in accounting 
at Harvard. The economics department refuses to teach it. Uh, but there is a major at accounting at UT Dallas. So most students who go to uh, institutions of higher education in the United States go to schools like UT Dallas, not to schools like Harvard. So that's a little bit of a difference. Nevertheless, of course, schools like UT Dallas offer many courses in the humanities um, and have majors. So they're also experiencing similar problems in that area. Um, so just to begin with one datum from Harvard, this year's entering class, that is to say, students who came to Harvard in September 2021, Eight, less than 8% said that they intended to major in arts and humanities fields, less than 8%. So a Harvard class is about 16 or 1700 students. That's about 130 students out of that class. Um, the um, arts, and, arts and humanities at Harvard comprise one of three, or four main fields uh, like most schools. Uh, social science, natural science, arts and humanities, and we have a school of engineering and applied science as well. Um, so as I say, less than 8% of freshmen first years indicated an interest in, take, in majoring in our fields. And this was uh, a shock because um, in 2013, uh, the number of first years reporting no an intention to major in arts and humanities was 18%. And we thought that was low. So seven point something percent is really kind of uh, crazy. So since 2013, the number of students intending to major has dropped by about 40%. Um, and to give it a little more, a more shock value, historically, students who report an intention to major in the arts and humanities when they arrive, 50% of them go somewhere else before they graduate. So we could lose half of the small number of students who already indicated an interest somewhat compensated for by students in other divisions, social science mainly, who switched to the humanities, but basically we're uh, losing in the balance of trade in that exchange every year. So it's, you know, it's a real problem. Um, we have 21 undergraduate degree programs in arts and humanities, 21 programs you can get a degree in. Um, so even if all of these 8% uh, end up concentrating or majoring in one of those fields, um, it leaves about seven students per concentration, per program. Um, um, and that is, as I said, is a fall off from already very low numbers of, uh, of majors. Um, so at Harvard, you uh, declare your major in the fall semester of your second year, sophomore year. And I'm just gonna read the numbers of new majors uh, in that class last fall who declared a uh, concentration or a major. We call it concentration. It's the same deal. Um, Slavic, one student. German, two students. All Romance languages and literatures, which are French, Italian, Portuguese, and Spanish, five students. Eastern languages and civilizations, five students. Music, six. Complet, eight. East Asian languages and civilizations, eight. Classics, 10. History of Art and Architecture, 15. Linguistics, 17. Interesting, linguistics actually is fairly steady uh, number of students uh, who concentrate every year. Philosophy, 30. Philosophy is actually growing. And English, 32. English is falling. Uh, it's like cratering in terms of numbers. Um, so 30% of Harvard faculty are appointed in arts and humanities departments. There's more faculty than students right now concentrating in humanities. Um, and enrollments have dropped proportionally. So it's not like they're just, they're taking our courses, but they're not majoring. They're actually not taking our courses uh, either. The big majors at Harvard, and I think probably most institutions, liberal institutions like Harvard today are government, um, economics, and computer science. They have hundreds and hundreds of majors. So I remember quite vividly the first department meeting in which we started noticing this enrollment uh, fall off. Um, when we realized that courses like we had a very popular course the European novel taught by a brilliant teacher, Philip Fisher, that usually got 150 to 200 students every year. It's getting 20 students all of a sudden. Um, we, I mean, we eyes fell out of our heads seeing those numbers. Um, and now a big course in English has got 25 students. Uh, there's no courses that have 100 students. 
when I first came to Harvard, which is about 20 years ago, just I would just show up and I would get 30, 60 students or 70 students. It just doesn't happen anymore. Um, so it's a completely new ballgame. So as I said, this is a national issue and it's not restricted, obviously, just to schools like Harvard that are um, entirely liberal arts and sciences institutions. It's, it's across the board. Um, between 2012, so 10 years ago, uh, in 2019, the number of bachelor's degrees awarded in English fell by 26%. The number awarded in philosophy and religious studies by 25%. And the number awarded in foreign languages and literatures by 24%. So basically about 25% of uh, fall off in the number of degrees awarded in humanities fields, at least in the literature uh, and philosophy. Um, as I said, at the beginning, the research universities took the biggest hit. And uh, I would say the, what's called research one and the Carnegie classification. Um, some of those schools reported in four years a drop of 40% of degrees of, um, over a period of four years. Um, in the class of 2020 at Yale, <clears throat> so the class that graduated a year plus ago, um, the number of students graduating with degrees in East Asian, French, German, German studies, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Russian Eastern European studies, and Spanish was four. And Yale, uh, like some schools, has actually been very aggressive in growing their humanities faculty, but it doesn't seem to be helping retain students. Um, so one thing to note about this, obviously, is it's, it's very precipitous. It's not like this is an erosion over 20, 30, 40 years. This is pretty, it's pretty recent. It really dates from 2012. And I'll try to explain why I think that's important in understanding what's happening. So as Vladimir Lenin used to put it, what is to be done? Um, so, uh, so as I said, the first thing I want to say is I don't have a solution for this problem. Like everybody else, I'm just trying to figure out what students want to do and how we can attract them to the material that we like to teach. Um, so the best I can do is offer some ideas about why we're in this predicament, what exogenous forces are causing this to happen, what endogenous forces are making it difficult for us to adapt, um, and then some ideas of changes that I would like to see, but maybe they're not really they're not the solution either. Um, so it's important to remember that when we talk about curricular reform, which is kind of where we're at right now. In other words, the curricula that we're accustomed to teaching, that we're trained to teach, is not connecting with student interests at the undergraduate level. Um, so when we're talking about reforming that curriculum, um, we're dealing with an institution. And institutions evolve over time, and they produce a structure that enables, but also restricts, uh, efforts to change it. But one way to put it is to say that um, the undergraduate population turns over every four years. In other words, if you wanted to change the demographic profile of your college, you just change your admissions policy. Four years later, you have a different looking class of undergraduates. Um, your graduate population turns over about every eight years or six to eight years. Um, it's getting longer, but that's how, that's how long most people take, eight or nine. Um, so the same thing's true there, that you're gonna get a new population every eight or so years in your graduate program. And administrations turn over about every 10 years. And these days it's very unusual for a president and an administration to stay in place for more than 10 years. It's, it's, the work is exhausting for people. Um, uh, so, so there's a turnover there. But faculty turn over every 40 years. It's very hard to replace your faculty. Um, so one of the things you have to think about when you're thinking about curricular reform is who's going to teach these new courses? Who's trained to teach these new courses? Who's going to train people to teach them at some other school in your graduate program? So, um, so that's a big institutional constraint. Um, universities are very big ships to turn around. Uh, there's just a lot of people there who were, you know, who are there for pretty long periods of time. Um, it makes a little bit of a difference, I think, whether you're a department or a program. So of course, as you know, a department can has lines and can therefore hire and tenure on those lines, but programs generally are, don't have lines and they're set up by getting people who are in departments uh, to teach in the program. 
So for example, we have an America studies program. It's not a department. We can't hire people to do that, but people who work in American literature, American history, American music, whatever, teach those students. Um, so programs have more flexibility. They're more nimble. Um, uh, and the curricular offerings can vary depending on who's available to teach it or who wants to teach it or what the program wants. Um, you can't really do that with departments. Um, you don't have that flexibility. There's people who are there who just have to teach four, six, two, whatever courses every year. Um, and, uh, and they're just gonna do what they do. Uh, so you don't have the nimbleness that you have with programs. The advantage, of course, of departments is that there's job security in a department. I mean, you're tenured in the department. Um, so the, you know, people don't want to be appointed in a program unless they have uh, a line in a department. Um, so the department is still the, even though there's lots of contingent faculty and so forth, the department is still the fundamental bureaucratic basis of universities. Um, so the other thing about institutions is that they're products of their uh, histories. Um, and when we talk about curricula, we're talking about disciplinarity. Uh, and the disciplines are about 100 years old or so. Um, the modern disciplines were all created between about 1880 and about 1920. Um, and they're about, they're happening until recently, it's been changing recently, but until recently, there are about 40 disciplines in a research university. Um, that's changing because disciplines are being added and majors are being added. So I think Yale has 70, 60 or 70 majors now. We only have 40 something, but that's the direction things are going. But, but disciplines in terms of training people, giving PhDs and then credentialing them with PhDs and then tenuring them, um, there's about 40. Uh, and they all pretty much date from that period. So they carry the uh, heritage of their foundation. It's, it's very hard, I mean, that's, they, they, they're grounded in a particular approach to their subject matter that's quite old at this point. Uh, it's very hard to move them off of that ground. I'll talk a little bit about what I mean in a second. Um, so my field is English. As I said, it hasn't changed much in about 70 years. Um, certainly my department, <laughs> my department hasn't changed much in 70 years, that's for sure. Um, you know, we cover literature written in English from the medieval period to pretty much the present. Um, and uh, the course, the department is organized historically. That's how we're trained. So uh, you're trained in a field, in a period, uh, Victorian, you know, romantic, modern, early modern, medieval. Um, there's additional subfields like the novel or theory or um, African-American literature, uh, which is really a field itself. Um, but it's basically organized historically. So you, you rarely find people who teach more than a period of about 70 years. Um, and, uh, and one of the obvious facts about student interest or lack of it in English, students are interested in literary history. Um, and that, but unfortunately that's what we're trained to teach. Uh, that's, that's how we learned the field. We learned the whole history of, the, of literature English, in English. And, and we, that's how we think about what we do. Um, but students don't, are not that interested in history. I'll try to explain why I think that's true, even though it's a little hard to understand. Um, uh, but that, so as I say, there's a problem with the way that we've been trained, which is very traditional, and where student interest seems to be going right now. <laughs> um, so English hasn't changed much, and really most of the humanities fields haven't changed much uh, either um, since uh, the middle of the 20th century. Um, despite the fact that we all talk about interdisciplinarity, it's a very buzzy term, and we, I think, all think try to think that way. The departments themselves are not inter interdisciplinary. They're balkanized by the nationality, and the arts uh, are all divided up by medium. Uh, philosophy is the chief that stands alone, doesn't have anything to do with these other fields. Um, so this disciplinary regime in the academic humanities is a residue of a time when that's how people thought about literature in nationalist terms. So you read French literature to understand the French character, to understand French civilization, to understand something Frenchness uh, about, about it. And this just isn't true anymore, pretty much. Um, people don't think about literatures in this uh, mononational way. 
to the extent we think about nationality at all, we tend to think of it as international or global or transnational, um, but the departments aren't set up that way, really. Um, so, and people aren't really trained that way, but that's, that's a case where a very old paradigm for what it meant to study literature has become a little bit obsolete. Um, and then, of course, they're divided up by nationality and therefore by language. So I can teach a Dostoevsky novel in translation in a course if I want on existentialism or something like that, but I can't, I can't teach a whole course on Dostoevsky because that belongs in my university to the Slavic department. Um, and there's just something unrealistic about that too because people read Russian novelists in English and they, there's huge influence on uh, English literature in the 19th and 20th centuries. And if you, if you push them off in another department, students aren't gonna go find those courses and they're gonna be missing out a big part of literary culture. Um, and the same is true, things true obviously of the arts that um, for people in the arts, they're, you know, they're comfortable with all kinds of artistic media and creativity happens at the crossroads of different media, particularly today, uh, particularly in the fine arts today. Um, and, this, and, and artists read books too and poems. So just this, this balkanization I think is hurting us. And although we, as I say, we talk about getting out of the silo and everything, institutionally, it's very hard to do that. There's no reward for it, you know, and professors need carrots <laughs> to do things. Um, so the heart of the disciplinary system is doctoral education. Um, that's where it's our bedroom. That's where we reproduce ourselves. Um, and as long as do professors are trained in traditional disciplines, uh, there it's hard to have true interdisciplinarity because they're only trained in one to do one thing. Um, well, interdisciplinarity today is all ad hoc. People people go out and grab something from another discipline, but they're not trained uh, generally to do it. Um, so, just in terms of the undergraduate level, if we want to undergraduates to learn something about history that's relevant to the literature that we're teaching them, we send them to the history department. Um, we, we offload or outsource teaching in those fields like history, sociology, uh, neuroscience. Uh, you know, we don't incorporate it generally into our own departments. We, as I say, we outsource them. I'll say a little bit more about this later on. Um, so, as I said, um, I'm going to try to separate exogenous factors from endogenous factors and trying to explain what's been happening. Um, and there's factors that are sort of, sort of in between too. Um, so in terms of what's happening outside the academy that seems to be having an effect on student interest in our fields, um, there was a 19th century English historian named Henry Thomas Buckle who wrote a book, uh, in 1857 called History of Civilization in England, in which he claimed that the marriage rate was a function of the price of corn. And this was a great scandal because we think of the choice to get married, to fall in love and get married is independent of some material factor like the price of corn. But if you of course think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think we think the same thing about students, that students go where their interests are, and it's hard to think that they're being motivated by some non-intellectual or non-academic uh, uh, desire. Um, so um, I think, though, there's no question that the number of degrees, the decline in the number of degrees in humanities fields, or I'll just stick to English right now um, is a function of the economy. So the high point in the discipline of English was actually 1970-71. Um, and that's when about 64,000 students in the United States got their bachelor's degrees that year, 71, in English. Um, and that was 7.6% of all bachelor's degrees awarded including degrees in non-liberal fields like business or education. Um, and since 1971, it's pretty much been downhill in terms of degrees. Um, in 2007, 2008, that academic year, 
there were only 55,000 degrees in English as against 64,000 in 1971, um, and accounted for 3.5% of all bachelor's degrees. And in 2019, which I think is the last date for which we have numbers, the number of graduate, sorry, number of degrees in English, undergraduate degrees in English awarded was 39,335. That's against uh, 55,000 in 2008 and 64,000 in 1971. And it was 1.9% of the total number of degrees in all fields. So um, one thing to keep in mind is that there are more degrees granted every year. So uh, the absolute numbers are falling. It's not just the percentage, which you would expect as degree programs expand and so forth. It's just the absolute numbers are also falling quite a bit, um, even though there are more students in the system by far than there were in 1971. So it's not hard to see why 1971 was the high watermark because it was the end of the post-war economic boom. Annual growth in GDP after 1950 averaged almost 4% a year. Um, and young people felt, I think, less constrained economically. They felt they could take risks. Um, it was also a period 1950 to 1973, a historically low gap between top earners and the middle class, uh, unprecedented in history. Now we're, we'd be getting back to where we were before 1950, where there, the, a lot of the wealth and income is, is uh, monopolized by the top earners. But in the, between 50 and 1950 and 1973, that wasn't as much the case. Um, so the students, I think, had a perspective that middle class was, had a safety net. Um, they didn't feel they were going to fall off middle class or out of the middle class if they majored in English or philosophy. Um, so I think that the, when the economy changed after 1971, there was the Nixon recession, there was the oil embargo, there was incredibly high prime interest rates, all the things that led to the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, uh, students regarded higher education very differently because they saw it as an investment that was either going to pay off in terms of future income or not. Um, and I think the number of uh, high school students going on to college dropped in the 1970s. A little bit that is a function of the military draft, because in the 60s, more people went to college, men went to college because they wanted to get a draft deferment. Um, but it's also a function of the economy as well. Um, <clears throat> so when did the current downward spiral begin? 2012. So what does 2012 mean? It means that 2012 is the first class that entered college after the recession of 2008. So they were highly aware of the precarity of the American economy. They, you know, they, they and their families had been through this uh, scary moment of financial recession that might have led to a serious depression. Um, so that makes them much more attuned again to the economic questions about the investment in a college education. It's not just money for tuition, it's also time. You're not working, you know? Um, and, and so the students think differently about what they're going to get out of it. They want to feel more confident that the investment is going to pay off, and therefore they're much more likely to get into fields, get degrees in fields where they feel there's a job opportunity. Um, so money affects all the humanities. I mean, on the one hand, we're a very cheap date because uh, we don't get paid as much as law professors or physicists generally, but um, um, and we don't have huge overhead in terms of labs and things like that. Um, but we also need funding to do our scholarship. Um, and uh, um, that's also been uh, something of a problem, uh, particularly in recent years. Um, so the amount to, that spend, to, the amount of money that's spent to fund the humanities uh, by the National Endowment for the Humanities is 3% of the amount spent by the National Science Foundation to fund scientific research. Uh, and it's half of 1% of the amount spent by the National Institutes of Health to fund research in natural and social sciences. So as small as it is, the NEH budget and just for inflation is a third of what it was in 1979. So we noticed that in, in President Biden's new budget, uh, he has increased the funding for the NEH dramatically it won't get anywhere close to where it was in 1979 yet uh, because Congress has been unwilling to fund it but, or, or raise the funding, but he's trying to raise the funding by a significant amount uh, as well as funding in uh, National Science Foundation and 
the NIH, though some of that funding, uh, proposed funding is earmarked for particular projects. But those things will help higher education if the Congress could see fit to pass the budget, which is a big question mark always. Um, private foundation spend, so that's government money, private foundation spending in the humanities goes mostly to museums and to historical societies. Just over 2% of private foundation spending goes to humanities and related social science research. Um, and that's been dropping as well. Salaries of humanities professors, as I said, are lower generally than salaries of professors in other disciplines like economics. Um, and acquisition budgets for libraries are being cut. Um, and libraries are also correspondingly cutting back on the number of monographs that they, uh, that they buy. Um, and of course, that's a problem for uh, young academics who need to publish a monograph, uh, usually in order to be considered for tenure. So we could say, well, 2008 is behind us. We've had 10 years of actually quite robust economic growth in the United States. Nothing seems to completely slow it down at the moment, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and the markets are doing well. There's a lot of liquidity out there. Uh, you can raise capital to you know, create your app or whatever it is that kids want to do. Um, so why should college students still be so risk averse? So I think the answer here is fairly obvious, which is that the money and opportunity are in tech. It's just, there's just, it's the happening thing economically. Uh, and not just economically, creatively. People look at tech and they think they're making new stuff. They're making all these incredible things. And there's a lot of creativity that goes into it. Now, probably when you get to work in those industries, it's a little less creative than it looks from the outside, but it's not unappealing. It's not like, it's not like people are just, you know, uh, crunching numbers, you know, people are thinking in a creative way. Um, and therefore they reward people who have brains and creativity, who are smart and can, you know, imagine new things. Um, so I don't think they're wrong to feel drawn to careers in those industries. I, I probably would want to be, when I was 18, I wouldn't probably get very far, but you could, you could sort of see why it appeals to them. Um, so I think that's an obvious factor. I think we all we all know that, that, that that's where student interest is going. It's not just going everywhere else, it's going particular places in the university. <clears throat> um, so those are like some exogenous factors that are not really in our control. Um, so what internal factors might be playing a role in this, uh, in this problem? Um, so I think, so these are just a little bit my own, um, criticisms of higher education, which might be just personal obsessions, but I think a huge problem is specialization. Um, that's just not true in the humanities, but it certainly is true uh, in the humanities. Um, so as I said, the disciplines are organized by specialization, um, both at the level of the department um, and at the level of the field of scholarship. So take an example, 18th century novel in English, you know, that's a standard field. Any English department that's well staff will have a person who just does 18th century novels. Um, um, but they don't, you know, but there's not a lot of conversation between people in different specializations. There's more in English probably than in other fields. In philosophy, some people are doing philosophy the other philosophers don't understand. Um, and that's true in some scientific fields as well. So specialization is a problem. It, it's, an, it's also a good thing. So the good part of it is that it's just, it's just part of the division of labor. So when you make a product on an assembly line, you know, somebody specializes in each piece along the way. Um, and the fact that they are specialists in you know, putting the muffler on the car or whatever it is, means they'll do a better job than if they're trying to do six different tasks. And that's the theory behind academic specialization and disciplinarity is that knowledge is a whole in some way, everything should hang together, but you're gonna get a lot better uh, research results if you allow people to specialize. So people spend 40 years working on Chaucer. Um, it's a little crazy, but I, I couldn't do it. But, but you're going to learn a lot more about Chaucer if you allow people to do that. But there's a way in which the more specialized uh, these subfields get, the more insulated they get from everybody else. And that's a bad thing. Um, so um, look at it this way. There's a tower and society pays for the tower. We're subsidized. Society wants us to do what we're doing. 
um, and they create a protected space for us to do it. And they pretty much recognize, despite a lot of rhetoric, the principle of academic freedom, which allows us to pursue our inquiry without fear or favor. And then within the tower, there are these silos. The society doesn't really care about the silos, and it doesn't really think about the silos. Um, but we do think about the silos. Then within the silos, there are bubbles. And the bubbles are the 200 other professors who are interested in that specialty. And for a long time, in my view, people became successful, got promoted and tenured in an academic discipline or in English in particular, by talking to the people in the bubble. And they didn't have to talk to people who weren't in the bubble. So just to give an example, when we promote somebody to tenure or attempt to promote somebody to tenure, we solicit, solicit outside letters. Typical candidate, I think it's 15 outside letters, something like that, 12 or 15. And all the outside letter writers are in the bubble. We don't ask people who were not in that, in that, in that candidate's bubble to comment on the work. So there's something wrong about that because people are starting to write just for a small audience of other people. They're not writing for a larger audience. I can expand that comment by saying that um, there are relatively few, I can't actually think of any, but the relatively few books written by humanities professors that are read by people who are not in the humanities. It used to be the case. Some people write trade books and you know, popular books, but in terms of you know, serious writing, it, it's very rare that there's a book written by an English professor or philosophy professor that's read by somebody outside the field, um, even in the university. And, and that's not true in evolutionary psychology. It's not true in cognitive science. Everybody listening to me has probably read a book in one of those fields because they have people who can write for audiences like us who don't know the science, but are interested in the questions that those people are asking. So that's a, to me, that's a symptom of our losing touch with a broader public that students will also be aware of, at least when they come into the university. Oh yeah, you know, this person, I heard about this person's book or my parents read this book or whatever. That, that we're missing that, I think, a little bit. And part of it is because we're just rewarding specialization. Um, society pays for us and we have a duty to society. We're producing knowledge for social good. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And if it's not getting to the public, it's not, we're, we're not doing anything uh, with what we've been given. Um, so uh, another problem is that uh, the humanities courses that's traditionally designed are not aligning with student interests. And at Harvard, the dean of our division, you know, so the humanities division is sort of put together various task forces to try to figure, I'm not on any of them, but try to figure out what students are interested in. Um, and they can, he comes up with climate and environment, social justice, technology, indigeneity and migration, and race and ethnicity. So the difficulty is that at least three of those uh, interests are really social science interests. They're not, they don't belong to the humanities. I mean, climate, environment, um, social justice. Uh, we do deal with questions of identity and therefore race and ethnicity because it's one of the ways we teach our, our material. But if you're really interested in racial justice, you're gonna take a government course or a political science course or something like that. You're not gonna take an English course. Um, so there's a misalignment between the stuff that we offer, the kind of things that we generally talk about and the kind of things that students seem to be interested in right now, college students seem to be interested in right now. Um, there's also the question of race and ethnicity I'm gonna to touch on briefly because uh, it's a deep subject is that it's, it, it's interesting question. So there's a lot of student demand or there's student demand from certain small number of students generally for more courses dealing with race, race and ethnicity and also for more, um, professors of color or now my professors. The professors of color problem is the problem I mentioned earlier, which is it takes 40 years to turn over your faculty. So you, you can't just replace all your white professors overnight. Um, and with, but you can replace the undergraduate population. So to the extent that you're having a much more diverse undergraduate population, 
the students will come and they'll say, where are the professors of color? And you say, well, wait 40 years and they'll be here. So that's a problem for us because that's important to some students that they're get, learning about material from non-white professors, not just students who are themselves non-white. Um, so that's a difficulty that we have. Um, <clears throat> But there's also a question of whether student demand translates into majors. Um, so I'll give you two examples from Harvard and maybe they're, maybe they're unique to Harvard. But one was that there was a great demand for students from students to create Department of Ethnic Studies. This had to do with a failed promotion case that caused a lot of uh, upset on the part of undergraduates. But, it, it, it predated that, and the administration is very reluctant to do that because it's not really a discipline. Um, so uh, when the students who were advocating for ethnic studies met with administrators, at some point they were asked, would you major yourself in ethnic studies? And most of them said no. <laughs> so they actually weren't that interested in taking courses in ethnic studies. They just thought Harvard's the kind of place should have an ethnic studies program. Uh, a more example, a little bit closer to home, is that a friend of mine in English uh, was asked by the department to offer a course in non-Western literature because it was student, supposedly student demand for such a course. So it wouldn't just be teaching literature by, you know, by white men. And he offered such a course. He's a world literature specialist. He knows those texts and also a course in literature from all over the world. Um, very, some of it quite old, some of it more recent. Uh, he had one student take his course. So, uh, so students want certain things, but if that translates into actually more students in our classrooms, I'm not really sure that's going to be so. Um, so uh, about four or five years ago, I was asked to uh, to, to chair a review of our uh, major requirement, concentration requirements, what students had to take to get the degree in our department, undergraduates. And uh, in order to prepare for that, I taught a course. For sophomores, uh, which is just called Introduction to Literature, or something like that. And my idea was to try to figure out what the sophomores were interested in that we offered. And I learned two things that I think were important, even though my department completely ignored them when I proposed them. One is the first thing I said, which is they're not really interested in literary history. They would say, why should we read books that were written before 1900 or 1950 or whatever? Um, I see that with graduate students a little bit too now. That's kind of an interesting problem. We could talk about it later a little bit. I have some thoughts about why. But anyway, as I said, that's a problem for us because that's against the whole DNA of the discipline. And second thing was they're quite interested in theory. A lot of people think that when theory, you know, it's, literature's always had theory. Back to Aristotle, it's like it's just part of the discipline. But when the theory moment happens in the 70s in English and literature, literary studies, people felt that's a turnoff for students. It's actually not, not in my experience because they respect theory because it's difficult, it's rigorous. They don't respect just close reading a poem because anybody can do it. There's no special knowledge required or they don't think there is, uh, but they do think these theory questions are difficult. And therefore, when you learn them, you have something other people don't have. Um, and that, that offers a certain appeal. When I talked to a different group of undergraduates who were doing research in the humanities over a summer program that we have, I asked them the same question, why, why are students not majoring in the humanities? And they said, it's not rigorous enough. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, that may just be a Harvard type student who thinks that's important, but I don't think that's true. I think actually students want to feel there's something there that is hard to get uh, that we're teaching them to do. Um, so a final theory, which has been proposed for the decline of students, proposed by a member of my department is the decline in Anglophilia. It was a little shocking when he said that, but I actually could sort of see the point. When, when I was a student in college, it was just 1970 or so, um, you know, we were kind of interested in England and we, that was kind of a cool place to go and you want to go to the Lake District and see where Dickens lived and so forth. Um, uh, and I think that's really not true for students today, partly because student body is way more diverse. Therefore, students have less family connection with Northern Europe than they might have had when I was in college. Uh, and the second, because uh, they see Britain as a slave trading state, as an imperial state, uh, it's 95 or 97 percent white. Um, you know, it's just it's not. There's no longer a lot of Anglophilia there. And because English departments, most of the literature that we study, at least historically, is, was written in England, uh, the British Isles, um, England and Ireland, Scotland. There's it's a problem in that sense. It's just people aren't interested. It'd be true of France too. Maybe that's why there's a decline also in Romance languages. So 
that's not quantifiable, but it's a possible thing. Um, So the only, the only last thing I'm going to say is that because it actually came up during the, when I was chatting before I started talking uh, in the introduction is that um, what's really odd to me about this student flight is that students listen to music all the time. They watch streaming movies, everything else all the time. They read contemporary fiction. They write poetry. It's not like they're not interested in culture. It's a big part of their lives, probably more than it was for us because they have more input uh, going on and they talk about it all the time. They're not connecting what we teach with, what, with that part of their lives. So to me, that's the obvious place to make the connection. I don't think we should be teaching about climate change because I don't know from climate change, but we know about culture. And if we could figure out a way to latch on to what's already out there, which is there's an unbelievable amount of cultural product that everybody's talking about, including 18 year olds. It'll help us show that students that, yeah, you can learn something about that if you take our courses. I also think that um, this is a little more, a little less sure about this, but a big part of the American economy are the culture industries, certainly Hollywood, um, television, uh, obviously the music industry, uh, and uh, book publishing. And we basically, you know, we're the center of world production and all that stuff. There's, there's careers in those fields. Somebody has to write that stuff, you know, somebody has to come up with it. Um, somebody has to know something about it. Uh, there's another case where if we incorporate a little bit more about the culture industries and how we teach, it might get students interested in seeing that there's a connection between the cultural product that they already know and the nature of culture industries and how they evolve over time uh, and the state that they're in now in the United States. So those are just areas where I think there's a more of a natural connection between what students are interested in and what, and what we're trained to do. But as I said at the beginning, I, I can't predict the future. So those are my thoughts. We have a few minutes for comments. All right, thank you very much. So let's look around. Anybody wants to ask? make a comment. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Menand. Um, very enlightening discussion. Um, so I guess one question I have is, near the beginning you talk about, um, yeah, well, it, seem, it seems to me like your uh, discussion kind of breaks down into maybe Four, four parts. Um, the first two of which you talk about first declining numbers in the humanities, and then um, you discuss the kind of maybe somewhat outmoded or certainly old fashioned disciplinary boundaries that largely govern the bureaucratic organization of the humanities. Um, and I guess I wasn't clear about what you saw as precisely the causal nexus there, um, if there was one. Um, you, you spoke of kind of the period around the turn of the 19th, excuse me, the turn of the 20th century, um, when these disciplinary um, fields were sort of consolidating and being professionalized. But, you know, not too long after that, in the 1930s, we saw the first comparative literature departments. The 1930s was also the time of the founding, uh, founding of the first uh, uh, American studies programs. Right. So clearly there's been some um, energy directed towards interdisciplinarity for, for some time, but I'm not sure that maybe you know something I don't, um, that those programs um, are, are, I would imagine that they're suffering because, because, because they are humanities programs, they're, they're, they're suffering these same or similar declines. Um, even though they are at least more inter interdisciplinary than say a traditional English department. Yeah, I don't know that, I don't, so your observation is correct. Um, there have been changes since 1920 um, and, and America studies is a classic example of that. Um, it is interdisciplinary by design. Um, I don't know, I don't know enrollment figures in that area. 
some at some schools it's a department and some schools like at harvard it's a program um and i don't not sure whether students are no longer taking courses in american studies i would think they would be because i think they would be more interested in an interdisciplinary approach to american culture so that you know that could be a success story but i, I don't know the answer to that um i think complet has always been a mystery to students <laughs> Um, so I understand the impetus behind it, but um, it, students feel a little bit intimidated by it. So it's never it's never been a particularly big part of the of the division. Um, but so I take but your question was what's the connection between dis over disciplinary or siloization and lack of student interest? So it's so as, as I say, it's partly because I think the siloization was formed in a period where, where people had very different ideas about what it meant to study literature and how the art should be approached than they do now. So do students pick up that? Maybe not, but it do, I do think it's a problem intellectually at least. Um, and the and it's I think it's not unconnected to the problem over specialization because um, people are you know trained in one field and that's all they're really credentialed to teach. So it's just really hard for them to, to connect with other fields in a way that would be maybe make the material more attractive. I'll put it a different way. I've had success as a teacher more often teaching interdisciplinary courses where I do art and film and literature and theory and so forth than I have just teaching straight up literature. Now, maybe I'm just not a good teacher of straight up literature, but um, I think that seems to attract students, not just majors, in fact, usually not majors, but often students are like, oh, I want to know about this sort of cultural moment. Um, and I want to know about a bunch of lots of different stuff. But I think that's a I think that's an attractive way to present the material. I don't want to say cultural studies is the answer because cultural studies has got a lot of ideological baggage with it, and I don't I don't think that's quite what we have in mind. But studying culture as opposed to studying a particular strand of it seems a more productive and exciting way to organize things. But you're right that for for 18, 20 year olds, I'm not sure they're going to pick up you know, what the difference is. Part, part of the difficulty is that it's part of student culture now to disparage humanities. Um, a student told me when I was having these discussions about why students don't major in feels like English that people say, oh, uh, when women major in English are looking for their MRS degree. I, I had not heard that phrase since 1948. I mean, that's really incredible that students, the students today would be talking that way. But they just think it's not, it's a worthless um, degree. So in, in that sense, my beefs about the specialization, disciplinary and so forth, they're probably it's, it's already too beside the point. Um, there, it, students are now socialized not to think, to think that this is not a good thing to spend their time on. Thanks. Yeah, maybe follow up just with another um, kind of question. So you've been emphasizing declining in numbers. So the numbers overall have become smaller and smaller and smaller. But one of the things that lately has again emphasized, and I believe that was also early on, part of the declining numbers in, in the humanities is the balance between men and women. So right now, for example, we see a sharp decline in male students enrolling in general in the universities. And I believe some of the decline early on in the humanities had also a bit to do with the fact that as we were moving into the 70s and 80s, areas that had been closed off for women slowly started to open up. So I think there's maybe a little bit more going on than just simply, you know, kind of declining numbers. There are also some interesting shifts within the existing numbers in terms of the demographics, social economic profile, but I think also in terms of the gender makeup. You're saying that uh, women undergraduates now major in areas have which, more choices than they yeah, would have had in the 1970s yeah. and that's but that's true of, i think that's correct um and there are i think substantially more women in american education than men um and that, i think that disparity has been growing also since the 70s but um so yeah i think you're right about that um and, and uh it's also maybe the case that um when you have more socioeconomic diversity in you know, undergraduate population and you have students whose parents didn't go to college or who were immigrants, uh, their notion of what they're going to get out of college could be quite different from a student who's from a well-off family or went to a private school. Um, 
the, you know, students are skeptical of the liberal education model, which is kind of where the arts and humanities sit in the institutional structure, because they don't understand why they should take courses in the areas they're not interested in uh, professionally. Um, and I've had students at Harvard ask that question. And I have to say, you know, liberal education has to be taken on faith, which is that if you pursue interests in fields that don't have a huge amount of utility or potential career usefulness, uh, it's going to it's going to help you grow your mind. You're going to have a, a freer, more open mind than you will if you just choose a specialization and bore into that. I say when you get to professional school, they will deliberalize you. So get liberalized first. Uh, you'll be a better professional because you'll be able to think more broadly than other people are who are specialized. So, but students don't they they're not willing to take it on faith. They just feel that it's too risky or they don't believe it. Um, so. You, so I think you used to be able to make that sell much easier 30 or 40 years ago than you can do it today. I mean, let's put it, let me put it a slightly different way. I, of course, I'm interested in the future of the humanities. I spent my whole career in this field and I you know, care about what we do. I like my colleagues, blah, blah, blah. I like all this stuff. But higher education as a system is very successful. It's not a problem because students aren't taking English courses. More people are coming into the system, more people are graduating, more people are getting trained for the workforce. It's just, it's doing its job really well. So I don't think this is a problem with higher ed. I think this is just an area of higher ed that's trying to figure out what, where its future is. Thank you. I see any other comments, questions? I just have Carl. a question. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I, in, in talking about the challenge of uh, shoring up and enrollments and interest in the discipline um, and thinking about the, the declining enrollments. You, I think you did a really fascinating job talking about the kind of external uh, uh, challenges external to uh, uh, maybe what we might call the work of the discipline, student interest and other things. But I wonder what you would say about the ways in which the actual internal work of the discipline has made um, has made claims um, or the attempt to sort of sell the, the discipline in the field harder, by which I just mean um, a deteriorating sense of what constitutes the proper objects of the discipline. I mean, um, you know, there's a way where even now we're, you know, big parts of the, the discipline are, you know, kind of explicitly and theoretically committed to, um, you know, not even a meaningful distinction between like literary objects and natural objects. Yeah. Um, you know, to what sense, if what we're trying to do is get students to study what we do, um, what would you say to the idea that maybe not having a coherent account of even what it is that we do and how it might be distinctive from other things? I mean, a kind of like, you know, grumpier way of asking the question is to say, like, you know, it's one thing to say if we're selling, you know, we're going to sort of do culture, but um, you can imagine a student saying, you know, yeah, I'm interested in, in culture. Um, but why should I study it with a professor in the English department and not somebody in anthro or in sociology or in uh, with cultural historians or in film um, or in a variety of other places? Yeah. Well, I think we should be more like anthropologists, but putting, putting that aside, um, I think that the uh, you point to in the beginning of my talk, I said I'm not going to get into, like, into intellectual debates because I'm not sure that's where the problem is. But it's true that within the humanities, there's a, not a lot of certainty about what it is that we're doing. And, and that, I think, would you agree, this is something that maybe the last 15 or 20 years has been happening? I think before that, I, I felt there was more focus. I mean, there were different schools of thought about what we were doing, but they were coherent. And if you're saying that that's sort of dissipated now, and it's not clear exactly what we're supposed to be studying or why, um, I would agree with that. And I think that that probably also doesn't help with students because they're not quite sure what they're getting into because we're not quite sure what we're giving them. Um, but as I also said at the beginning, I, I, don't, I don't see a solution to that just because it's, all, it's kind of endemic to our areas that we don't agree on what we're doing. Um, but uh, I think that's why I don't, I don't want to oversell culture as a concept because it's a pretty amorphous concept. But I think that's why the, the less it's focused on the literary, which is kind of what departments, people have been trained to do for a long time, and the more it's expansive it is, 
just the more opportunity is to bring other stuff into our into our classes and to our research. And I, to me, that I mean, intellectually, I think we should be doing that anyway. I just think that's we should be going in that direction. But I, I also suspect that I hope that it would generate a little more student interest. But as I said to the gentleman just a minute ago, it's in the student culture, and that stuff's very hard to eradicate. Um, and uh, there, it's not students don't react very rationally to to changes in you know courses and stuff like that. They tend to react according to how their peers are framing it. And right now, the, the framing isn't isn't good for us. So, I guess one th way to put it would be to say that we might have, we not, might not solve the enrollment problem, but we might make some intellectual progress if we think about what we're doing slightly differently. Thank you for that comment. Thank you for that question, Dr. Hatfield. Um, I think that just about wraps it up though. We are at our four o'clock marker. So I think if you all wanna join me again to thank our speaker, to make us think a little bit about what we do in the humanities and uh, to kind of continue to probably um, think about our respective roles and, and jobs to do. One of the things that really strikes me though is you know you emphasize very strongly uh, the extent to which this is a national story and in many ways it is but i think it's also an immensely local story and every university enrollment is also very local in particular you know if we think about our local market and one of the things that we've realized is that uh, we experience maybe some of the same things as far as majors are concerned but we have fairly large enrollment from outside of our school in our various programs, including literature. So there is, you know, I think maybe the turn of the tide at the end of the tunnel might be that for the coming generation of the majors in engineering or business or whatever, that they, you know, kind of bring together that commitment with an interest in, in literature, but also very often in the arts. So that in many ways, I think they, they may end up being a little different than their predecessors and the ways in which they navigate the various offerings on campus. Yeah. That's what we start to see a little bit here. Yeah, that's good. I mean, every school is different. You're quite right. Um, every school has its own population, its own its own stakeholders, its own history, its own strengths. Um, and yeah, and every school should address these questions with those things in mind. There's no one size fits all uh, response to it. And yes, to your second point, my best students tend to come from non humanities yeah. fields they just they get interested in something and they and they you know they're doing it because they care about it excited about it um and if you're getting those students in your classes that's as good as majors uh you just we need bodies in the seats because we want everybody to take an english course we want everybody to take a philosophy course well you know that's that's what we want they don't have to major in it but they should they should learn something about it absolutely so thank you again um okay. for being with us today and uh also for everyone for joining us and we will upload, obviously, this um, conversation so that others can still appreciate it. And we want to okay. thank also the Center for Translation again and Dr. Schulte for organizing this. Thank All you, right. everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.